Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for governor. And this week's live stream, we wanted to talk about single payer health care, a public health insurance program. We have a bill in New Hello, York called thanks the for New joining York us. Health Act, I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green which Party passed candidate the state for assembly governor. for consecutive and years. This year being the fourth year in the state senate. It has, is co-sponsored by all the Democrats in the state Senate. They're one vote short of passage. So the question is, will the next governor sign a bill if the uh, Democrats take the state, state Senate and this bill gets passed? Uh, what it would do is provide all medically necessary services to all New Yorkers at lower cost to the people of New York, the economy of New York, than we're paying now for our multi-payer mixed system of private and public health insurance programs. And the reason it will lower costs is that it will cut out all the administrative waste, about 30% of every healthcare dollar, which goes into figuring out at the provider's end, the doctor's end, if the service is covered, and then if the insurance company will actually pay for it. The insurance companies don't like to pay because it comes out of their profits. So a lot of times there's back and forth and a lot of communications. If you've, and it's hard, every plan is different, so you don't know what services are covered. It's just a nightmare in terms of all the paperwork, all the staff. Uh, typical for every doctor, you need two and a half people doing the paperwork just to get services paid for. It's a big mess, and that's why in this country we pay twice as much as any country on earth for, per capita for health care, and we don't cover everybody. And, uh, you know, even now with the Affordable Care Act, we don't cover people who don't have uh, documentation for their citizenship. Uh, people are finding with the insurance they got right now, they can't afford to use it because of the high co-pays and deductibles, and they get uh, really lousy insurance so they can keep the cost down, so it really doesn't cover much. Uh, so we really have a system that doesn't provide uh, for the health services that people need. So the savings, as I mentioned, come from administration. It also comes from cutting back on the monopoly profiteering that particularly the drug companies, but also medical device suppliers and the for-profit uh, provider, providers, hospitals, doctors, clinics, uh, now charge because of their monopoly position. So uh, we, can, we have the highest drug costs in the world, for example, with a single payer system, we can as a collectively bargain with the drug companies to bring those prices down, which a lot of countries do in this country, there's federal law saying Medicare, for example, can't bargain on the health care costs, so, on the drug costs. So that's another reason our costs are so much. So that's why we can pay less. The, the bill uh, calls upon the governor to set up a, a progressive tax system, having a progressive payroll tax, as well as taxes on unearned income of the wealthy. That would be you know, profits, capital gains, dividends, interest. And in that system, and also the federal money that now goes to Medicaid, Medicare, and the child health program uh, would all go into this single public payer. Uh, that creates a problem because if we pass it, we have to get a waiver from the Health and Human Services Department at the federal government. That'll be a problem under the Trump administration, but we can pass it and then fight for that. And uh, after this election in the fall, the uh, balance of power may change in Washington. So first thing to do is pass it in the state. Um, the other thing I'll say, and then we can open it up for discussion, is uh, we're not going to get this signed, I think, unless we elect a Green for governor. The Democrats have a terrible record on this. Uh, of the Democrats running for governor in the primary or on other ballot lines, Governor Cuomo has been equivocating. He says it's an exciting possibility, a good idea, but he didn't put it in the state of the state address. He didn't put it in his budget. He hasn't talked about promoting it. He said he'd prefer it to be done at the federal level. Uh, so whether he would do it is very questionable. Uh, Cynthia Nixon has said she's for it, but she has to win the primary. And then uh, Stephanie Minor, a Clinton-type Democrat who's running on this Serve America movement, will probably be on the ballot in the fall. And she said, equivocating like Cuomo, well, we got to see if the numbers work, blah, blah, blah. I don't think we can count on her. And of course, the conservative candidates, the Republican and the Libertarian, are opposed. And then we have the record of Democrats where they had the opportunity to do this. In Vermont, the uh, Progressive Party, which uh, 
<clears throat> is a third party, but mostly cross endorses Democrats in Vermont. Uh, made a deal with the Democrats not to run somebody for governor, so uh, a Democrat would win, uh, Schumann or Shulman, and uh, he promised to uh, implement single payer, pass the legislature, and then he stopped. He blocked it. And he said it was a cost problem. And uh, that bill was compromised because it didn't put everybody into a single payer. So there were a lot of problems with that bill, but uh, the Democrats didn't follow through on their promise. In California, uh, twice the Democratic legislature passed the bill, sent it to the Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who vetoed it. Since uh, Jerry Brown's been in there, the Democratic legislature has decided they're not going to pass it. Uh, and then in Hawaii, they had the same experience. Under a Republican, the Democratic legislature passed it. The Republican vetoed it back in 2009. They now have a Democratic legislator and the legis uh, a governor, and the legislature won't pass it. So. If we want single-payer health care, if we want the New York Health Care Act passed, uh, I think we need to elect a Green. I don't think we can count on any of these Democrats. I, I will say if Cynthia Nixon does get through and wins, uh, if we take her at her word, she would sign the bill. But she's got a long way to go. I expect, as you may have heard a uh, week before last, the, uh, Nixon and the Working Families Party came out with a plan to get her off the ballot if she does, on the Working Families ballot if she doesn't win the Democratic uh, primary, which means in the fall, the Greens will probably be the only progressive ticket on the ballot and the only one committed to single-payer health care. So with that, um, this is a real opportunity, and uh, I think it's top of the list of the real reforms we can win. In 2014, we got 5% of the vote, and as I've said before, I think Governor Cuomo, who wanted to roll up the vote to lay the basis for running for president, had to look at our 5% and say, what were we demanding? And he adopted in full or in part some of the things we were calling for. The ban on fracking was probably the biggest issue that year. We got paid family leave. Uh, we got partial movement toward the $15 minimum wage we were campaigning for and toward tuition-free public college, the Excelsior Scholarship, which really falls far short of that, but he felt he had to make that gesture. So. Um, the bigger vote the Greens get, uh, the more leverage we'll have going forward, and hopefully we'll be in the governor's seat and we can sign this uh, single-payer health care bill when it's adopted. So let's see what we got for questions. What's the difference between single-payer and a government-run health care system like they have in the UK? Which would you prefer in the long run? Well, the health care system in the United Kingdom is a health service, and it's like public schools. The doctors work for the healthcare system on salary, like our teachers work for our public schools on salary. In the single payer program, what is socialized or socially provided is the insurance. So providers, doctors, hospitals can be uh, private, uh, preferably nonprofit, and they then provide the service and build a single payer. So it's an insurance program. The program in the United Kingdom is a service, so it's insurance plus it has the staff that provides the health care services uh, on the staff of the system. Uh, there are a number of countries that also provide this besides the United Kingdom. I believe it's Denmark or one of the Scandinavian countries does it, Costa Rica does it, Cuba does it. Um, and where they've studied in a lot of the states uh, and you can find this on the Physicians for a National Health Program website. Studies done to see whether the mandate program like Obamacare or Romney Care, uh, what its cost would be, what a single payer health insurance program would be. And in the case of California, they also studied a single payer health service program like the United Kingdom. And in all these studies, and there for a lot of states, you can find them on that Physicians for a National Health Program website, single-payer health insurance always comes out as the most cost-effective, the least costly. But in California, when they looked at the health service, it was even less costly. So in the long run, that's what I would like to see. And back in the 1970s, uh, there were three plans. There was Nixon's plan, which is like Obamacare. It mandated health coverage by employers. and uh, other ways for people to get on coverage, but it was a mandated program, kept the insurance system private except for Medicare and Medicaid. And then there was the Kennedy Bill, which is a single-payer national health insurance, as they called it then. Nowadays, we call it single-payer. 
And uh, then there was a National Health Service that Ron Dellums, the uh, congressman from uh, Oakland and Berkeley, uh, put in. And that bill was written by the Medical Committee for Human Rights, who had been the medics and doctors who uh, helped the uh, people in the Civil Rights Movement and in the anti-war movement who got you know, beat up by the police or, or vigilantes uh, and patched them up. And then, you know, they wanted a real, the best health care system. And what I like about the Dellums bill that has not been in these single-payer systems is that it had local health districts with boards that were elected. The majority was elected by the citizenry, the people that use the service, and a minority of the board was elected by the providers, the workers who provide the health services. And that gave local control and democratic accountability. And then those local boards federated at the state level and then the national level to coordinate the system overall. So it was much more democratic, which I think is the way we should do uh, public, even if it's a public health insurance program, we could incorporate that into the bill. And you know, if uh, we have negotiations and I'm governor, I would urge the uh, New York Healthcare Act to incorporate that so that uh, each community has, and people have a real say in, in how the system is administered. So for now, there's so much momentum for a single payer health insurance program that's where I think we should go right at this time. And then over time, the concern of the people, one of the concerns of the people that were pushing for the health service was that if you have a health insurance program but the drug companies are still for profit and some of the providers are, they would kind of feed at the trough of public insurance and max out their fees for service and uh, be a real drain on the system when it could be more economically efficient if it was a health service. So, uh, but let's get the single payer health insurance passed and see how it works. And that's what England did. They got health insurance for workers back in, the, I think it was 1911. And then coming out of World War II, uh, they expanded to a health service because it was more economically efficient and would cover everybody, not just people who are employed. So uh, that's my answer to that question. Seth says, solidarity from Maine. We need single payer now, no more insurance companies. Jimmy asks, how is single payer M for a going to be paid for. M4A stands for, that's one of those internet abbreviations I'm not familiar with. Medicaid for all. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we call single payer improved Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, because Medicare, which I just got on this year, doesn't cover all medically necessary services. You know, for example, I have a condition on my foot. I have this hard callus that develops, probably because I worked on my feet all my life in construction as a Teamster in warehouses. And I was having, it was covered under my Teamsters plan, uh, and Medicare used to cover it where they, you know, he just takes a scalpel and cuts it off so I'm not walking on, like, walking on a pebble all the time. Now both the private system and the Medicare system has said, you can't get that covered unless you got diabetes, which I don't have. So, um, I have a, you know, a procedure that ought to be done every six weeks that's $80 out of pocket. So we say improved Medicare for all. And how is it going to be paid for? Okay, it's by progressive taxation. In the case of New York, uh, we had a study done by Gerald Friedman, who was an economist at uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And he did what the, the bill would have the governor appoint a committee to do as soon as the bill passed, and that is develop the tax system progressive taxes on payroll, and then other taxes on unearned income, on capital gains and uh, interest and rent that the wealthy make. And then also the federal programs would fold into that. So uh, in Friedman's model, uh, he had a progressive scale for the payroll tax and then the uh, tax on high incomes, the unearned income. And in that model, 98% of us would pay less in taxes than we now pay in the combination of the taxes we pay for Medicare and Medicaid and the S-CHIP program, the Child Health Insurance Program, plus the co-pays, deductibles, premiums, and out-of-pocket expenses we have to pay under our private insurance. So that's how it would be paid for. It would be a combination of progressive taxes and, and the federal programs already uh, that we already pay for that would in case of a state health insurance program, single payer, would fold into that, uh, that fund, the single payer fund. And as I mentioned, we have to get a waiver from Federal Health and Human Services Department, which 
Under the Obama administration, there are indications that they would, you know, approve those waivers because they want to make sure a single payer system covered at least as many people as the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, which it does. It covers more. Um, the Trump administration is another question. But as I said, after this election in the fall, Congress may change hands. And Trump, if anything, is a political opportunist, and they may just, like, not want to have that fight. We can hope. And if they, we have to have a fight, we will do it. And we can go national, and we will fight Trump from New York because he's denying us our right as a state to have a better health care system. Why is, the, why, is that, why is it that the United States was stranded with for-profit exorbitant health care when so many other countries have single payer or national health service? Well, I think our, the two things. One is generally ideologically this country is much more committed to a magical belief that the market can solve all problems better than uh, the government. And that's patently false, whether you look at public power or health care. You know, take Medicare. The overhead for Medicare, that's basically a single-payer system for seniors, is 3% compared to 30% with the larger system. If you look at uh, public power utilities that uh, municipalities have, and there's some state programs. We have NIPA, and there's one in Washington. And it's, uh, other states, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, they provide uh, power at an average today of 13% less than investor-owned utilities, or private IOUs, we call them, investor-owned utilities. So that's just nonsense. It's just a dogmatic belief. Um, and if you look at the realities, um, you know, you, we can do some things much more efficiently in the public sector. So we've had that ideological belief that has been very consciously promulgated by the capitalists in this country, the one percent whose concentration of wealth has been growing steadily for the last four or five decades. Um, and then the American Medical Association, the doctors, uh, the more conservative medical association, has been jealously guarding their prerogatives and their quasi-monopoly position over the delivery of health services. And they thought they would lose money if we had a public system, which would control costs better than a fee-for-service system. And the doctors, have, a lot of them, have changed uh, in recent decades because we've had a corporatization of health care and you no longer have the family doctor going around doing house visits and, uh, you know, being on a much more small-scale fee-for-service system. We have big hospital corporations. Doctors find it difficult to practice and cover all the overhead dealing with the insurance companies unless they're part of the uh, hospital network. Uh, which brings up another difference between the single-payer system we're talking about and these private insurance plans. Under the single-payer system, you can go to any doctor you want, free choice, and uh, every doctor can get reimbursed by the single-payer system. When you have private insurance, you often have a network. So if you go to doctors outside the network, it's going to cost you more. And sometimes you find that what you need is outside your network, or you happen to get ill or injured outside your geographic area and you have to go out of network and it costs you a lot more. And even people insured uh, end up in situations where they go bankrupt paying their medical bills. Bank medical bills are the number one uh, reason why people go personally bankrupt. It's about half the people in the country just because they happen to get sick or injured and their insurance wasn't good enough uh, or didn't cover uh, the services they wanted. So. Um, that, I think that's why it's been a matter of politics. Now, public opinion polling, going back to right after World War II when the Truman administration first proposed and the Democratic Party put it in their platform, they wanted a national health insurance plan, national single payer. Uh, polling has shown that the majority of people want that kind of system and that those polls have been consistent since the 1940s up to today. So, but that's a problem with the American politics. Public opinion doesn't translate into public policy because people, the concentrated wealth translates into concentrated political power. So you may, may have heard of the oligopoly study a couple of political scientists did a couple of years ago and they looked at like 1,700 issues where public opinion polling said what the people want and where that conflicted with what the capitalist elites wanted, Congress did what the capitalist elites wanted. 
in every case where there was a conflict. So that brings up a whole bunch of other questions. But I think that explains why we've had difficulty having a sensible health care system like every other industrial country in the world has. Question, if single payer is passed in New York or countywide, countrywide, in other words, in the U.S., do you think the capitalist class will stand for it, or will it provoke greater class conflict and radicalize more working class folks? I think the capitalists, when they look at their budgets, will find that it will save them money. Right now, if they want to cover their people, they have to go to these health insurance programs, and the biggest escalating cost for business is escalating health care costs of their insurance plans. And if you're in a union and you've negotiated with your company, uh, you have to forego wage increases and other benefits to keep up with health care costs, or you've had to increase your co-pays, deductibles, uh, and your insurance quality has gone down because health care costs have just kept skyrocketing. Uh, in the case of New York, we have business owners who have signed on and they've looked at their budgets and found Right now, if I remember to figure right, the average uh, health care cost for a company providing health insurance for their employees is 14%. Under the uh, single-payer system using that Friedman study, it would be 8%. So that would save 6% of their payroll. That's a good amount. Um, there are businesses that have relocated to Canada because the health care is covered there by their single-payer system, which they call Medicare. Uh, and uh, so I think they won't mind as individual capitalists, even though ideologically it kind of goes against the grain. Uh, will it provoke greater class conflict and radicalize working class folks? Uh, yeah, I, because I think if it's done under the Trump administration, they're going to resist and people are going to fight back. Um, so I think in this case, it'll come from the most reactionary wing of the capitalist class, which is backing Trump. Um, but either way, um, we got to push forward and and as I said, you know, just if you're a business and looking at your budget, single payer is going to save you money. What do you say to friends and family who are convinced that single payer will lead to lazy people taking advantage of the system, making quality health care too costly or unavailable for people who currently enjoy decent medical benefits? Well, we have the record in scores of countries around the world. Um, hypochondriacs will use private insurance, whether it's public or private insurance, to you know, go and, uh, you know, get treated for things that don't exist. And that's a very small percentage of people. Most people would rather do other things with their day than go to the doctor and, you know, say, I need some medicine or look at me. Um, so that's, that's a non-issue. And because we're going to cover, we're actually, we're going to cover people who are sick, who are poor, and, you know, we have to cover those costs. But that's people who are sick and, or poor are not lazy. They're just sick and poor and they need health care, and this system will provide it for them. What can folks do right now to get single payer in New York? Well, I, you should stay on top of your legislators, both the Assembly and Senate. You should raise the issue in every opportunity you have, letters to the editor, candidate forums. Uh, one of the things Governor Cuomo could have done was uh, really push the state Senate uh, to get all the senators on record as to where they stand on the New York Health Act, but the Republicans prevented it from coming forward, and uh, there was no pressure put on them to do so. If there's a special session, you can raise a stink then. I think what the best thing to do is get this into the public debate, and then people can look at the merits of the plan. Um, and then when November comes, vote for candidates that support single payer. And uh, so make it a, an election issue. Now is the time when we have leverage on the public debate. When, uh, and if uh, the voters are saying we want single payer, the candidates are going to have to respond to that and they'll feel the heat. What do you think about the Times Union article yesterday on single payer in the governor's race? Well, if you read through that article, you'll find that, as I said earlier, Nixon's for it. Cuomo and Minor equivocate, which means if you look at the records of Democrats in other states, it means we can't count on them. And uh, the Republican is opposed. They didn't ask the Libertarian. And the quote they had from me was that I was for single payer before the bill was written, which is actually true. I mean, I was for the health service when it was the Dellums bill versus the Kennedy bill versus the Nixon bill back in the 70s. And it's been something that I've advocated, you know, over 40 years now. Um, I also told her that, you know, the question put to me, would you veto the bill? 
And I said, no, I'd sign it in a heartbeat. Um, so as usual, the narrative was the Democrats, Republicans, and then Howie's at the end, last, last one line paragraph, one sentence paragraph. So I think the narrative's got to change, because as I said, when we get the, to the fall after the primary sort out the candidates, we're going to be the only progressive option on the ballot. We'll be standing where the majority of people stand on the issue of health care. And uh, <clears throat> so hopefully the narrative in the Times Union and the other media will change on, on this issue and others. Ursula says, thank you for being such a persistent advocate for health care as a human right. Well, thank you, Ursula. Ursula is actually... Uh, working to advocate for this, organizing people to support it. That's Ursula Rosen, who lives in Syracuse, and uh, she's been campaigning with the Campaign for Single Payer Health Care. And uh, so that's another thing you can do is, is find that campaign, go online, and sign up, and they'll give you as much work as you want to do advocating for single payer. Okay, so uh, somebody wants to know how to get more involved in our campaign and, and what we're doing uh, in, in the near future. Well, the way to get involved in the campaign, quickest way is to go to HowieHawkins.org, the website, and there you'll find all the news releases we put out, our policy statements, biographies of me and my running mate, Gia Lee, who's a public school teacher. Um, and I wanted a teacher because Cuomo's education policies have been terrible. And she's an advocate for the opt-out movement. She's an advocate for a union. She's a top-notch union organizer. If you've heard about these teachers and right-to-work states going on strike, Gia's one of the people in the background supporting them. She's an incredible union activist and organizer. And I'm really proud to have her on uh, my team, our ticket. Um, you will find there where you can sign up to volunteer. You can donate there online or find out where to send a check. Um, so all the information you need is right there. That's how to get involved. What's coming up, uh, G and I just did uh, two days uh, doing news conferences and media interviews in Albany, Syracuse, and Rochester. And uh, that was very successful. We got a lot of coverage. That Times Union article, they didn't come to the news conference, weren't covering health care, or weren't covering education. But I think when they started writing that article, they had our, new, our phone numbers on the news release and uh, called us up. Otherwise, we might not even have been in the narrative. Um, tomorrow is uh, Friday, and I will be doing a taping of a news broadcast that uh, airs on the ABC station here in Syracuse. It's called Newsmakers. It's a half hour Sunday of public affairs program. And uh, that will be online. All the you know, video and audio recordings that we've done during the campaign are on the website. And we'll post that when it goes public. And then I'll head down to Ithaca, New York. Uh, I'm going down there with Mark Dunley, our comptroller candidate. Uh, we're going to have an interview with the Ithaca Times. And then we're going to do a public talk in the Workers' Center, which is on the, uh, the mall. What do they call it down there? The, 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 it's a, there's no... Uh, cars on the street, and uh, anyway, the, it's above the Autumn Lees used bookstore, the Worker Center is, and we'll be talking about climate crisis, the Green New Deal, the theme of our platform, and ecological socialism. So everybody's welcome to come there. It's, that's at 5 o'clock, and uh, so that's tomorrow, and then I need to look at my calendar to see what I'm supposed to do next, because it's just from one event and one activity to another. And all I can tell you is we're going to campaign our hearts out till November and hopefully make an even bigger difference this year. Last question. Gloria asks, can you tie single-payer health care into environmental justice and the Green New Deal? Yes. Uh, the Green New Deal is basically we want to do fulfill the goals of the New Deal as FDR articulated them in his last State of the Union address in 1945. He said we need a second Bill of Rights, an economic Bill of Rights. Everybody should have the right to a decent job or a livable income, decent home, a great education, health care, and some other things related to fair markets. And that was picked up by the Civil Rights Movement and they added we have to get rid of discrimination, racial discrimination in employment, education, and housing. 
And we've picked up that torch and added the question of the environment, a sustainable environment, particularly the climate crisis we're failing. So we call it a Green New Deal. And when it comes to environmental justice, we know that uh, the environmental problems of toxic poisoning and uh, remediating after disasters, like look at Puerto Rico right now, uh, poor people, people of color, are at the back of the line. And they're uh, bearing the greatest burden of toxic pollution. Example, Sheridan Hollow, black community right next to the Capitol, had a uh, oil-fired power plant there that created a lot of health problems. It's, they get temperature inversions because the hollow's downhill and the uh, Capitol buildings are up on the hill. And we finally got that shut down in an environmental justice campaign in 1994. Now Governor Cuomo wants to reopen that plant as a frack gas plant. And frack gas uh, may be cleaner out the pipe than coal or oil, but it's still dirty and you'll still get temperature inversions. So that's an example of environmental racism that our governor could stop right now by you know, getting that permit withdrawn. So this goes on. And the relationship to uh, the healthcare system is it provides for all medically necessary health services. So poor people and people of color who tend to have less access to the healthcare system will not have full access whenever they need it. And I did a news conference, I think it was last week, about the lead the child-led poisoning crisis in this state. You may have heard, probably heard, about the big brouhaha in New York City where the New York City Housing Authority lied to the feds in their reports on how they're dealing with lead in the public housing system. And uh, then they lied or misled on the degree to which children have been poisoned by the lead in those NYCHA units. And they used the state standard of 10 micrograms per deciliter in the blood uh, to say that only 19 children were lead poisoned. But the federal standard is now 5 to, uh, micrograms per deciliter. When they recounted, it was over 800 children were lead poisoned in New York City. So the de Blasio administration has been taking a lot of heat for that. And there are people in NYCHA who they lost the, uh, the, the person who headed it up had you know, resigned over this. And, there's some other officials who may be in criminal je jeopardy because of the lying to the feds. We had the same problem here in Syracuse, which is the lead poisoning capital of the nation. Forty percent of our children have blood levels above the federal standard of five micrograms per deciliter. This is 46 years after the Surgeon General issued an urgent warning in 1971 saying, test the children for lead, treat them if their lead levels are high, and remediate the sources. And this was largely due to lead paint, which was banned in 1978. And here we are 46 years later, and almost half the children in this city of Syracuse have elevated uh, lead levels, which can cause uh, retardation of mental development, motor skills, and behavioral problems. We're poisoning our children. So, you know, in terms of environmental justice, aside from the fact that a single-payer system would give everybody whose children are lead poisoned access to treatment, we call for a statewide law to make landlords <clears throat> get lead safe certificates before they rent out units. They should not be renting out units that uh, poison the children. That will force the landlords to do remediation. Uh, we need more money in our city so we can do adequate inspections and remediation. This city of Syracuse can't even, uh, doesn't have enough inspectors, can't afford enough inspectors because uh, they're short of money and they can't cover the three plus family units. Now the city council here just passed, you got to cover the one and two family units like Rochester did, but none of our inspectors are lead certified to do lead inspections. We need more money to be able to do that. And the state has been cutting revenue sharing and imposing unfunded mandates that is why the cities are so fiscally stressed. So we called for uh, fully funding uh, inspections and remediation at the municipal level. We got to inspect the water faucets in our schools. Uh, they inspected, uh, I believe it was last year, and, and the Natural Resources Defense Council looked at the inspections and they found that 82% of our schools have at least one water faucet that is, has elevated lead levels. So we're calling for annual inspections and remedi remediation of those water faucets. Um, the certification of people to do lead inspections in this state is not strong. The asbestos uh, training is, is a much better model, so that's got to be strengthened. So those are, I think I'm forgetting one of the points, but we had a five-point program. 
Uh, so environmental justice is a very big issue for us. And you know, the link to the healthcare system is when people are poisoned by environmental problems, they need to get access to the healthcare system and a single payer system will provide it. So no more questions online. And uh, I, I just sum up by saying, reminding you that uh, to get more involved, go to the website, you can sign up to volunteer, uh, give us some money. We rely on small donations from regular folks. We don't take money from for-profit entities. And uh, we have much less money than the other campaigns, but we get a lot more mileage for the money we do get. And we get a lot more votes for the money we spend. So that money donated is money well, well worth spent. And uh, I'd also urge people to get involved. You can get literature off the website to download and make copies and you know, spread it among your coworkers and your family and your friends, your neighbors. Um, and we can get, you can get involved in a more organized way, canvas voters, identify where our supporters are, or people who need more information and we can get it to them. Uh, there's plenty of work for everybody to do and, and we'd welcome your support. So I think that's it for tonight and thanks for watching and uh, we'll, I guess, do this again next week.